What if just beyond this season of turmoil is your best season yet? Kevin Wallace dives into how God can turn any season into a time of blessing in his new book, After This. It's available now to order. Receive your copy today by visiting www.kevinwallace.tv. Stand firm and believe there is an After This. Hey family, Kevin Wallace here from Redemption to the Nations Church. I've got a message for you today that I believe God gave me to bring strength and hope and joy to your journey. I want you to get your heart open. I want you to get ready to receive this word. I don't believe your life's ever gonna be the same again. God's getting ready to take you to a new level. I'll see you at the end of this message and we'll pray together. God bless, enjoy this word. I was going to preach another message and I felt like God re- rerouted me as I prepared my heart for this morning. And this morning I'm, to- I'm going to talk about breaking cycles. Look at somebody tell them, neighbor, the cycle breaker is in the house. Yeah, I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about Jesus. Jesus is the cycle breaker. Somebody say amen. Galatians chapter 5 verse 1. Let me just tell you this, at the beginning of the year, it's a good time to break some bad cycles. And it's a good time to start setting in order some new habits and new patterns that will will not only help the trajectory of your life, but will secure and protect the trajectory of your life. And so we're going to talk about breaking cycles this morning. I want to read one verse of scripture and then I'm going to go um, fly through several stories in the gospels that I think are germane for the message that God has put on my heart this morning. Verse 1, Galatians 5, breaking cycles. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. Stand fast in the liberty by which Christ, how many know Christ made us free? I said, how many know Jesus made you free? Uh huh. And I want you to know today that if he sets you free, you're free indeed. But you have to heed this word. Do not be entangled again. Don't get back in the cycle with a yoke. A yoke. How many know that is a bad word right there? Yoke. How many want to break the yoke? How many want to see yokes broken today in our lives in Jesus' name? So, Lord, today, I thank you for breaking cycles in this place. I pray in January some patterns that have been unproductive and some cycles that have been vicious would be broken off the hearts and the minds and the lives of the people of God. And I thank you in advance for what you're going to do in every heart and life. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. Amen. You can be seated in the presence of God. The dictionary defines a cycle as a series of events that are regularly repeated in the same order. And most often the cycle leads back to the same starting point where the same series of events happen again, sometimes with different makeup, different clothing, different names, different places, different jobs, different cities, but the same cycle over and over again. Cycles are happening in our lives all around us, whether we are aware of it or not. In virtually every area of our lives, if we look closely, we will see cycles. When you walk outside this afternoon, you will experience the winter. And the winter is part of the weather cycle of living in this city. And how many know it's a frustrating cycle when they say snow and you get rain? August every year, our sons and daughters go back to school and they start their school cycle. After lunch today, and some even right now, your stomach will start talking to you and you'll start looking for a place to eat lunch because your body is set on an eating cycle. Breakfast you get in the morning, lunch in the afternoon, dinner in the evening. Beyond the cycles we experience in our humanity, we can even see cycles in our spiritual walk. Some of you might be shocked to understand that God is a God of cycles. We always say, and I certainly believe this, and in our own personal lives, God is at times very unpredictable. But the reality of it is, if you look closely at the Bible, God is a very predictable God. 
In fact, when he brought Israel out of Egypt, he set a divine master calendar for his people in the Old Testament. And on that calendar, he put seven annual feasts centered around seven holy days. And he created and prescribed this calendar of annual feasts so that his people could continually encounter the fullness of his redemptive plan that would be played out over all of time. These seven holy days and these seven feasts are discussed throughout the Bible in both testaments. But in Leviticus 23, we we see all seven holy days listed in chronological sequence. These seven holy days are called the feasts of the Lord. And in the 23rd chapter and the fourth verse, listen carefully. These are the feasts of the Lord, says Moses. Holy convocations, which you will proclaim at their appointed times. Now the word feast is the Hebrew word moed, and it means to keep an appointment. And holy convocation literally means the dress rehearsal. In other words, the feast of the Lord were were appointed times of worship for Israel that became a cycle that they went through every year so that God could clearly announce his redemptive purpose and plan to the entire world. And it began, it commenced at Calvary when Jesus became the Passover lamb and was slain for the foundation of the world. And I'm not going to talk about all of the feast in between, but I will tell you it will commence at the end when Jesus returns and establishes his kingdom and he rules and reigns forever. How many know God is already declaring? He's not going to sneak up on, he's not going to sneak up on us without us knowing. The Bible said in Thessalonians, Thessalonians, we are not people of the dark. How many know we are people of the light? We don't stand in the dark and watch the news to get spiritual revelation. My revelation doesn't come from CNN, Fox, MSNBC, OOANN, whatever. My revelation comes from this book. And when I watch something on television, it simply confirms, if I'm watching television, what I've already read in the back of the book. Some are going to get more wicked. Some are going to get wilder. But Jesus is coming and hell cannot stop the coming Lamb of God. We're going to win and God's already announced it in the playbook. Somebody say amen. Amen. So these seven feasts represent, typify the sequence, the timing, the significance of the major events of our Lord's redemptive career. And what was initiated in the old covenant in the feast of the Lord became a prophetic type and picture of what would happen and be fulfilled in the new covenant in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. It's one big cycle. God is a God of patterns and he prophetically announces in these patterns what he's up to and what he's going to do. But I want to tell you today that just as God creates and operates within redemptive cycles, the Bible gives clear witness that the enemy is also attempting to create cycles of destruction in the lives of humanity. The cycle of the enemy can be a cycle of sin, the cycle of bondage. It can be a an addictive cycle. It can be a a cycle of fear, a cycle of failure, a cycle of shame, a cycle of self-destruction. It may be a cycle of warfare in which the enemy just predictably tries to come back over and over again, keeping stuff stirred up against you and I, trying to hinder us through these cycles from stepping into our destiny and accomplishing the purpose that God puts you on this earth to accomplish. In fact, it was the enemy who in the book of Judges, if you read the Bible, you'll see it throughout the whole Bible, but I really think it's clear. In the book of Judges, you can see this whole thing of of cycles playing out. Seven times, seven times in the book of Judges alone, it says that Israel, listen, Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. Picture this, Israel would wander into sin and idolatry. They would be led into bondage in which oppressors would come in and take over and try to ruin and wreck their lives. In their bondage, they would cry out to God and repent. God would hear their repentance and forgive their sin and then he would come and restore his people and they lived for a measure of time in that freedom but seven times after God granted freedom the next chapter or the next verse says but Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and when they started doing evil in the sight of the Lord the entire cycle of sin Bondage, repentance, restoration started all over again. 
I'm talking to some people this morning that need to see their life. We need to see our lives from a big picture, bird eye point of view. Because if the enemy can keep you in a cycle and can keep you narrow-minded and myopic, nearsighted and not understanding that he is working overtime trying to destroy our lives, we'll keep going through these cycles wasting precious time. Satan doesn't want to create a simple cycle that you can exit easily. The enemy creates cycles that are complex and deep. They are embedded cycles that are connected to your emotions and your heart. They mess with your mind and they attempt to affect your identity. In fact, the enemy loves nothing more than creating a cycle in your life and mine in which we become identified by our issue and defined by our defeat. As I studied this today, I become acutely aware of the frequency with which scriptures include the length and duration that a person can get stuck in a cycle. It doesn't, the Bible just doesn't arbitrarily record the cycle. It literally tells us how long the cycles last. Why would the Bible tell us that they walked in, the, in, in Egypt or in the wilderness for 40 years after they came out of Egypt? Why would the Bible tell us they lived in Babylon for 70 years why would the Bible go through uh, time descriptions through all of the people of God and all these people in Scripture that God broke through and helped? Why would he tell us that? Because I think God wants us to know that just because you've been settled in a cycle of defeat for a while doesn't mean the enemy gets to write the rest of your story. I believe God wants us to know that it could take, sometimes it may take years, and I'm going to freak you out. It might even take decades. But I want to tell you right now that God is stubborn and God is long-suffering and God is patient and God is merciful and the devil will rise up and God will rise up greater because God is always going to finish what he starts in your life. The issue is not will God stop the cycle. The issue is will you allow him to break it so that you don't have to live through that thing again. And so when we flip over from the Old Testament to the New Testament, we we see these cycles not just affecting the corporate body of Israel, but in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, these cycles are very descriptive and the details are many in the lives of individual people that Jesus came to help. And I just wanna take a minute in the middle of this message right here and thank God that Jesus is the cycle breaker. That when you can't break yourself out, you can't break your kids out, you can't break your family out, there is a risen Savior who has the anointing to break you out and to disrupt the cycle and to set your life on another trajectory and to set your life on it. I know it's snowing and I know some of y'all worried about lunch, but I'm worried about some people stuck in a cycle and they can't get free and they've been wondering how will I ever get out of this mess that I made. I'll tell you how you're going to get out of this mess that you made you're gonna let the one who can break the cycle interrupt the chain of, of operation today and put the devil out of your mind put the devil out of your house put the devil out of your marriage put the devil out of your God's about to break the cycle when we flip over to the New Testament we begin to see cycles and how they afflict people in a more personal way and there are a couple of stories I want to run through real quick and each of us teach each of those stories teach us something about breaking cycles. Number one is the Gospel of St. John, the fifth chapter. So here lies a man. He is not 38 years old. I used to say he was 38 years old. He is not 38 years old. He's had the condition he has for 38 years. He's probably more like 58 years old. However long or old he is, he's had this problem in his body for 38 years. Three decades, two, sh two years shy of being four decades. How many know that's a long time to be screwed up? For almost 40 years, he was in bondage and he was paralyzed. Everybody say paralyzed. Now what's interesting about his paralysis is that uh, he had, even with his paralysis, he had people who helped him get dressed and people who helped him go through his routine. 
Because the Bible said that it was normal for him to find himself at the pool of Bethesda. And at the pool of Bethesda, there are five porches. How many know that's good news? If you don't know it, five is the number of grace. If you're going to drop me off anywhere, drop me off where grace can be found. Because how many know amazing grace can save a wretch like all of us? And if I'm going to be messed up, at least put me at the porch of a place called grace so that God can put my life back together again. Somebody say amen. The Bible said in this gospel of John, the fifth chapter, verses one through 10, that the paralytic was bound for 38 years. Someone came and carried him and dropped him off at the pool with the rest of these messed up people. They were blind, they were lame, they were impotent, they had no strength in their bodies. They were waiting to die or waiting on a miracle. The first thing I want you to see about breaking a cycle is that you and I have to stop making excuses for the cycle. I'm not getting any help in this Holy Ghost Church on Sunday morning. But Jesus stepped into the man's plight and problem. He came walking into the man's dilemma, surrounded by all kinds of messed up people. Jesus looks at the man who has been a mess for 38 years and says, do you want to be made whole? And the man looked at Jesus and said, sir, I have nobody who is able to put me in the water fast enough but while I am coming, another gets there before me. I don't know who needs this today, but cycles will not break if you keep making excuses. Excuses empower cycles to continue. When God shows up and says, do you want to be made whole? You don't say, well, I was born in this family. Or, well, I don't have no money. Or, well, the church hurt me. Or, well, somebody dropped me. Or, I know those things are all real. And I'm not trying to talk you out about of the, of the reality of your pain and all of your issues. But at some point, if the cycle is going to break, you have to rob the cycle of the power to stay in control of your life by telling yourself, yes, I've been messed up for 38 years but I am being given the opportunity to step out of my past and to step out of this predictable dilemma and to break out of this ongoing 38 years wake up in the morning lame they dress him and drag him to the dress him and they drag him to the pool of Bethesda and he's lame and he's just messed up and he's a paralytic and he's got issues and 38 years he's on his way into the water and somebody jumps in before him and one year he got real close and somebody jumped in before him and Jesus comes and says do you want to be whole and the man says I this is a Ooh, this is a word. And the man says to Jesus, I have no man. I have no man. And that's what religion will do to you. Religion will keep you addicted to men and women who can't ever produce the breakthrough that you need. I have no man. I have no woman. I have nobody. And what I'm trying to tell you today is that's not a curse. That's actually a reality check and an opportunity for you to step into a revelation that of course you don't have a man. If you would have had a man, you would have already and it got out of this cycle but the fact that you've been stuck in it 38 years is a revelation that man cannot bring you out of this but the good news is when the man recognized he didn't have a man another man showed up it was a different kind of man slap somebody tell him no more excuses no more excuses you and I have got to break the cycle by ceasing the excuses. Jesus comes in and says, do you want to be made whole? Ready, I'm about to blow your mind. Jesus can come in and say, do you want to be a businessman? Do you want to be a mom? Do you want to be a husband? Anytime God asks you a question about and gives you an opportunity, he did not consult your past to determine your future. 
And you've got to learn that your future is greater than what you've been stuck in. If you are identifying your future because of the mess you've been stuck in in your past, you will stay in the cycle. But I came today to tell somebody that the anointed one, Jesus Christ, is able to break you out of that cycle if you will stop making excuses. You cannot say, well, I was hooked on drugs and my brain is messed up. You cannot say, I never graduated high school. You cannot say, I didn't know how to handle money. You cannot say, I went bankrupt. All that is true. But if Jesus breaks in like he's going to break in for somebody, he already knew you couldn't get out of it on your own and he didn't hold your future hostage because of what he saw you as a victim of in your past he's going to break you out no more excuses do you want to be made whole I have no man I know that but thy faith hath made thee whole and he watch this the Bible says immediately 38 years messed up and immediately. Oh, I don't want to preach on immediately yet. Let, 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 me, let me go to point two. Let me go to point two before it starts snowing hard. Number two, not, 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 only, not only do you have to stop making excuses, but number two, this woman over in Luke's gospel, uh, pardon me, Mark's gospel, the fifth chapter, this woman had an issue of blood for 12 years. Over a decade, over a decade of desperation. How do you know she was desperate, Pastor? Because she spent all her money. <laughs> Everybody in here knows to save something. I mean, at least save some for a chicken sandwich or a, or a Happy Meal. Save some kind of money. But this woman, the Bible says, spent everything she had. Why do you spend everything you had? Because you get to the last cure and it promises it's going to heal you and all you got is a little bit left and she looks at her future and says if i don't find a cure i'm going to die so i'm going to spend all i have left on this last ditch cure to break me out of this cycle can you imagine the cycle of shame this woman was in the cycle of pain this woman was in do you recognize that because she had an issue of blood the bible uh, lets us know that she was unclean that when she walked into society surrounded by people in the street, her obligation out of law was to announce to the people standing there, I'm unclean, don't get, don't get close to me. Do you know after 12 years of walking around feeling unclean, it starts messing with your mind. Who am I talking to in this room today? It starts messing with your mind. It starts getting in your psyche. You start thinking, maybe I really am unclean. Maybe I really am untouchable. Maybe I really am as screwed up as they told me that I was. And it's not that I want to stay like this. It's that I don't have the power to break myself out. I've spent all I had and everything I spent brought me nothing. And I'm still a mess. I'm still a woman known as the woman with the issue of blood. Isn't it funny that 2,000 years later when we preach this, we still call her the woman with the issue? Do you understand that even church people, where are y'all at this morning? Even church people who saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost, speaking in tongues, prophesying, we like to identify people by their problem rather than by their victory. You don't believe what I'm saying. We don't call him Bartimaeus. We call him Yo, where y'all at this morning? We call him blind Bartimaeus. But can I tell you, he ain't blind no more. In fact, he didn't die blind. One day he walked all the way to Jerusalem with Jesus and saw them crown him Hosanna. And he was standing in the crowd as a witness and a testimony that Jesus can deliver you from your cycle. So point one is no more excuses. Point two is this woman with the issue of blood, after 12 years of the same cycle, she got aggressive. Look at your neighbor, slap your neighbor, tell them be aggressive. Be aggressive, be aggressive. You say, Pastor, how was this woman aggressive? At some point you have to get sick of the cycle. 
I don't know who I'm preaching to. You have to get so sick of the cycle that you start talking to yourself in crazy ways. This woman got so sick of the cycle of people running when they saw her and turning in the other direction. She got so tired of looking at herself and recognizing herself as an unclean person. And one day she said, oh, I hear that this man Jesus is passing by. So the Bible lets us in on the conversation that she had within herself and she said within herself she didn't tell her friend because she didn't have many friends but she told herself see listen to me family if you're ever going to break a cycle you got to monitor the conversation going on on the inside of your head because the conversation you're having with yourself will announce your future and the enemy will often try to get in the conversation that Kevin is having with Kevin so that Kevin screws up Kevin and keeps Kevin in a screwed up pattern but I want to tell you when you break out of that cycle you start talking crazy and you start speaking by faith and you start saying if I can but touch the hem of his garment I know I will be made whole I tried Dr. Yay Yay and it didn't work I tried the ointment and it didn't stop my problem but I heard about this man named Jesus I heard he opened up the blinded eyes I heard he made the lame legs walk and I don't know how he's gonna do this but if I can just touch the hem of his garment and what I like about the aggressive woman here is that she did not wait on an invitation and she did not wait on a church person to let her in she found out he was in the street and she went walking through the crowd and said excuse me I came to touch Jesus some people in here are part of the crowd but there's somebody that came with a cry of desperation and if you touch him he'll break the cycle somebody shout in this church she got aggressive you will never participate in a miracle if you are passive passive people miss miracles Bartimaeus I just talked to you about him he heard Jesus was passing by and he said son of David have mercy on me and that set off the religious people and they said to Bartimaeus shh you're a bit loud have you ever sat beside somebody with that look on their face you're a little bit extra I feel like God is stirring up this house to be an aggressive house I'm not talking about we're playing God and making things happen because how many know he's sovereign and he alone can work the miracle I said he's sovereign he alone can break the breakthrough I said he's sovereign and he alone can step in and snap the cycle but sometimes he's trying to find out how bad do you want what you've been crying about and some people want it bad enough to cry but they don't want it bad enough to get aggressive and go after the miracle I'm about to crawl up on this television and preach to somebody and tell you if you get aggressive this atmosphere is pregnant with your miracle if you get aggressive God will release everything you've been asking him for you if you reach out by faith like blind Bartimaeus blind Bartimaeus didn't sit down when they got mad at him the Bible said he took a big deep breath and he cried out all the louder Jesus son of David have mercy on me slap somebody tell a neighbor be aggressive be aggressive be aggressive over your children 
Be aggressive over your marriage. Be aggressive over your miracle. Be aggressive over your money. Be aggressive over your future. Quit letting it pass you by. Somebody be aggressive. When I played football, they had some cheerleaders. Yes. And they said, be aggressive, be -E aggressive, B-E-A-G-G-R-E-S-S-I-V-E. -E -E. So some of y'all are in the fourth quarter of your life and the devil told you the scoreboard is too upside down for you to win. But I came to cheer you into a posture of aggression today. And I came to say, be aggressive. B-E-A-G-G-R-E-S-S-I-V-E. -S -S -E. Be aggressive. You will not. That's why Israel, Jacob said, I will not let you go until you bless my life. Somebody shout, be aggressive. No excuses. Be aggressive. Last point, Luke 13. And I'm getting out of y'all's hair. Or toupee, or weave, or extensions, or whatever you brought with you. Look at someone, tell them neighbor, no more excuses. Tell them be aggressive. And verse, uh, the, uh, the third one is, number three, let it go. Ah, Jesus, help me here. Luke 13, open your Bible there quickly. A woman wrestled a spirit of infirmity for 18 years. Everybody say 18. 18 is six plus six plus six. The devil is at work in her life, even though she goes to the synagogue every week. I can't get no help in this holy church. 18 years, bowed over, and could not straighten herself up. Somebody in this room has had a hard time straightening yourself up. And this woman had a spirit of infirmity. I want to ask you a question. How long has it been since you could straighten up in your life? Straighten up your habits. I ain't getting no help. Straighten up your money. Straighten up your mouth. Yeah, preacher, you're meddling now. Straighten up. Come on, straighten up your job performance. Straighten up your school life. How long has it been since you've been able to straighten things up? The Bible said this woman couldn't straighten up for 18 years. And one day in Luke 13, stuck in this cycle, watch, she's bent over. And when you're bent over, your face is always in the earth. Which is exactly what bondage does to you. It keeps you looking in the flesh realm. I can't find no help in here, catch it. It keeps you bent over looking in the flesh realm when the writer of Hebrews said looking to Jesus. See, you can't look up at him if you're constantly weighed over looking into the flesh realm. The Bible said for 18 years she came to the synagogue bent over. One day out of every week, she would come to the synagogue on the Sabbath and the one place that she was hoping could find hope, don't miss this, had laws in place that prevented her from getting free on the Sabbath. So the law said you can't loose anything on the Sabbath, no work. The only day she could come to the synagogue to worship God was on the Sabbath. The point is, the religious system empowered the cycle. 
the only place she can go for freedom is locked up in religious bondage and nobody prays for anybody in the synagogue on the Sabbath because we don't want to have to break a law. And in comes this dear lady, bowed over 18 years, walking under the weight of this spirit of infirmity. And the Bible says in the 12th verse, Jesus came in and saw her. She couldn't see him, but I'm grateful that he could see her. I wish I had some help in the church this morning. Somebody in here or somebody watching me online has been under a weight for so long, it's kept you from seeing Jesus. But I feel like God wanted me to encourage somebody and tell you that when you couldn't see him, it did not keep him from seeing you. He's got his eye on you today and he knows what you're dealing with and I got news for you. If he sees you, he not only sees you, but he's coming to your rescue. Somebody shout amen. He saw her and he called her to him and he said to her, woman, now don't miss this because the Lord helped me see this this morning. Woman, you are loosed from your infirmity. Don't miss this. He did not say infirmity come out of the woman. He said, woman. Catch it. He did not say infirmity, get off her. He could have done that. The problem is this infirmity had become her infirmity. She had it so long. He said, woman, you are loose from your infirmity. She had that mess so long, it became part of her identity. Jesus and he wanted her to know you have owned something that tried to own you 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 have adopted and received I feel the Holy Ghost on me right here you have taken something in that I never intended for you to harbor or carry see that's the problem for some of us in a cycle we've allowed the spirit that was supposed to be broken to take up residence and become part of our lives that's why when Jesus said what is your name he said legion for we are many and if you stick around church long enough you'll ask somebody what the problem is and they'll say legion for we have many problems and they'll start telling you about their marriage and their spouse and they'll start telling you about their job and their boss but I'm going to tell you right now you got to get rid of what does not belong to you and what is not a part of your future woman thou art loose from thine infirmity you called it yours but it ain't yours I called you free now in the name of Jesus loose that woman and let her go loose the woman and let her go that's Jesus responsibility you loosing it and letting it go is your responsibility. Touch somebody, tell them, Jesus loosed you. Come on, tell them now, let it go. In order to finish this sermon, I gotta take you back to one of my favorite movies, Frozen. How many know that Anna and Elsa needed some deliverance? Come on in here, somebody. And there's a song that we sang when the movie came out and the song was, let it go, let it go. Don't let it hold you back anymore. Let it go. I don't even remember this thing, but this thing got all over me this morning. And the last part of it said, the storm never bothered me anyway. I came to tell somebody, you got some stuff that came into your life and the devil tried to hook you up with it and for a few years you let it get you but I came this morning I came this morning in the middle of January to tell you that the spell breaker and the cycle breaker is in this house and whatever you let move in it's time to let it go snap three people tell them let it go let it go let it go let the infirmity go let the anger go let the food
foolishness go let the drama go let it go let the pain go let the cycle go let the shame go let it somebody hop up on your feet and begin to give God praise all over this house I'm through preaching but your Bible said when God looked at her and said let it go immediately she straightened up it took her 18 years to get screwed up but it only took one second for her to straighten up I feel like God is about to straighten you up God God is about to straighten you up God is about to turn your life around God is about to break the cycle somebody shout after after he loosed her the bible said immediately she straightened up and she didn't need a praise captain and she didn't need a lesson in how to talk in tongues and she didn't need nobody to teach her how to dance because when she stood up immediately the bible said she started glorifying god nobody gotta tell you when to praise him nobody gotta tell you how to praise him nobody gotta tell him you ought to praise him if you ever been bent over and bowed over and broke down and he lifted you up you will praise the lord thank you father thank you father lift your hands if he's ever straightened you up lift your hands and give him glory if he's ever broken a cycle lift your hands and give him glory if you believe he's breaking a cycle in your mind today loose him loose him loose him in the name of the lord break every chain break every yoke loose your people let them go not by might not by power but by my spirit if you need a cycle broken throw your hand up where you're standing right now i don't care why we know you ask what it is if you need a cycle broken throw your hand up if somebody near you got their hand up reach over right now in the authority of jesus reach over right now and say loose them say it with faith and authority loose them and let them go loose them and let them go loose them and let them go loose their mind loose their emotions loose their sexual identity
the anointing breaks the yoke. Give him three claps and a shout. off of you. I feel years breaking. I feel years breaking. I feel decades breaking. I feel change breaking. Yeah. If you praise him, he'll do it in your house. If you praise him, He'll do it in your house! One more time, three claps, and a shout! Come be out of the pasta. Loose her. 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 breaker is in this house and tell them you tell them you say we will never have to step back into that cycle again say we're free now give him one more shout of praise
got it. When you start singing, I got it. So whether you feel it or not, if you believe the cycle breaker is here, I want you to say, I got victory. I got victory. I got victory. I got victory. seasons are just beginning if you believe God broke a cycle and you're thankful for it but you don't want to leave until he releases a fresh new season throw your hands up right now father I thank you that cycles have been broken today but I thank you that you're not stopping with a broken cycle you are releasing a new season and it's a new season and it's a new day a fresh anointing is coming your way somebody throw your hands up and take it right there it's a season of his power and prosperity I give you glory for it God it's a new season it's coming come on sing it over your mind don't let religion talk you out of it sing it again it's a new season it's a new day it's a fresh anointing fresh anointing it's coming your way it's coming your way I declare it's a season and prosperity oh, 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 oh. it's a new season come on y'all sing it one more time sing it over your mind yeah. it's a new season there's a brand new day. It's a new day. 
season of power and prosperity over your life it's a new season and it's coming to to me seal that lord seal it over every house seal it over every family seal it over over every son and daughter i thank you for releasing us from cycles and letting us step into new seasons Listen, I believe that God is speaking to hearts right now. If you've watched this message today and something said, brought strength to you and built you up in your spirit, gave you hope for tomorrow, I thank God that in this day and hour that we're living that there is a word from the Lord. And the Bible tells us we don't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. We need the word of the Lord. And today this word I pray has produced faith in your heart. You want someone to agree with you in prayer right now. I want to take this moment to pray with everyone watching because I believe God's going to meet needs today. If you're lost and you feel like you're full of hopelessness and sin, just call on the name of the Lord. If you're sick in your body and you need him to touch you, you just call on the name of the Lord. If your family's falling apart and you need God to rescue your family, I want you to know there's a miracle for your family for those of you who are watching today. Let's pray together. Father, move by your spirit right now. Someone's reaching out to you in faith, God. They need a miracle today. They need you to turn their situation around. I thank you that there's no impossibility. There's no problem too hard for you to solve. There's no mountain too big for you to move, Lord. Do it for them today. We agree together in prayer in Jesus name that lives are being changed right now by the power of God. In Jesus name. Amen. I love you. Be blessed. Check us out on kevinwallace.tv and I'll see you next week. God bless.